I think uh, when uh, he was 12, I think, when I met him, and we were at the Royal College of Music together uh, with Albert Salmon's teaching. And uh, in those days, they re I think the music establishment did realize that they had someone quite special. Uh, because he would suddenly disappear from an orchestra rehearsal in, in the Royal College of Music and go and play the Tchaikovsky Violin Concerto with the BBC Symphony Orchestra, you know, and then come back the next day uh, as if nothing had happened. He, he had this ex sort of sublime modesty uh, uh, about his play, but unfortunately, it, uh, he was too modest, I suppose, uh, in the way of the public life. Uh, and no one really took him by the, the, the scruff of the neck and, and said, here is a, a virtuosity which should be much more exploited, it must, it must be exposed to the public. I think when he went to the Prague Festival, uh, the Prague competition, he did so well there. That, but in those days, somehow competition winners didn't achieve the instant success uh, that they tend to, to get nowadays. Anyway, Alan sort of went on uh, playing uh, for years. He, he took time off to be a, a concertmaster with one of the London orchestras, which was not his role at all in life. He was very much an individual. And, uh, and then we had an ensemble together where we used to play, it was really for pleasure, uh, we would do two violin concerts and, and Anthony Hopkins, the, the uh, narrator and, and pianist, would come with us. And uh, we'd go around England uh, looking for a golf club to, to play and, and a hotel where we could play poker after the concert. It was, uh, it was idyllic, really, because particularly as Tony Hopkins was mad about cars and he always had very grand motor cars that we could uh, travel in. No, those, those were good years. And then uh, Alan sort of went into the doldrums as a player. He tried working in the freelance world and it didn't really suit him at all. He was much too good for any of this. And eventually, after many years, I persuaded him to come and play with the Academy. And he could, always, he could sit where he liked. He could sit in the front, he could sit at the back, whatever he wanted to do, whatever. And, uh, when we came to record, I think, with Vivaldi, the Four Seasons, that was the big moment where we could show what Alan could do. I mean, he had this extraordinary uh, ability to... It, I mean, he had immaculate intonation. And it was some of the cleanest violin playing anywhere in the world. I mean, I'm not just talking nationally now, I'm talking about anywhere. And anyway, uh, we, we made the, uh, the, the recording. And of course, it, it was quite early on in the, uh, the passion for uh, having the Four Seasons play, playing that tour in every hotel room. So, uh, and, and the records did rather well. Uh, and so th that at least established him as a personality in, on the music scene. Uh, but um, he sort of lost interest in wanting to play in public, I think, as a soloist uh, in his latter years anyway. Do you think he was content with the career he had? No. Uh, I think even when he was very ill in his latter years and he talked to me and said, was there any chance of him recording the, uh, uh, the Bark Suites? Uh, and I'm, I'm not a recording company, but I could use influence in that. And at that time, uh, no one was, was uh, interested in trying to sell Bark Suites, uh, violin suites. Uh, it's, it's, it, but he, I think he knew, looking back on his life, that it had so many opportunities that somehow never matured. They never materialised. Was he bitter about that? Oh, Alan uh, could never be bitter. No, his, his personality would never allow him to be bitter. He would make jokes about it. He would laugh about it. Uh, but uh, he would not be... Uh, he would not blame the profession, I don't think. He would. Uh, he, he, he was an extraordinary man.